Okay, let's get on with the show. We're gonna knit something in the round using a tool that you may find scary, but the rewards can be so something. I don't know, I ran out of steam. Hey all y'all, welcome back to my channel. My name is Carrie. This is where I talk about crafting, normally knitting, but other things too sometimes. <laughs> but this is where I share with you my tips, my tricks, my opinions, my preferences, my experiments, my whatever, my experiences. That was the other thing, my experiences uh, when making things. Today, we're getting towards the end of the year and maybe you noticed. Maybe you heard me mention that this year I've been doing a series of videos on in the round knitting. And there is one technique with this, with knitting in the round, that I have not really gone in depth with. It's probably the topic when it comes to in the round knitting that can be the most intimidating to knitters. DPNs! <gasps> yes! DPNs, double pointed needles. This is the OG way of knitting in the round. But there's definitely a learning curve with them and they can be very intimidating to knitters who haven't tried them before and knitters who have tried them before don't always love them and don't, and kind of give up on them. But believe it or not, there are advantages to double pointed needles. The fact is with double pointed needles, unlike other techniques, you can knit any size circumference and especially when working small circumferences, they're really efficient and speedy, but they do take some knitting used to, and they do take some experimentation to figure out how they can best work for you. If you're interested in mastering these bad boys, hit subscribe, hit the notification bell, give this video a thumbs up, and let's knit. Before we jump into all the exciting information for today, just a reminder that down in the description box, you will find timestamps to various parts of the video. Of course, I always hope that you'll watch through at least one time, because you never know what neat tip or trick I might throw out there that you never thought of before or didn't know about, but sometimes there's something specific you want to get to. Also down in the description box, you will find a list of materials that I utilize for today's video and resources that might be helpful for you. Some of these will have clearly marked affiliate links. If you click on one of these links, it'll take you to a shopping website. And if you make a purchase, I then earn a small commission, which helps support my channel. If you utilize one of my affiliate links, thank you so much. It's so, so appreciated. And if you don't, that's cool. I'm just so glad that you're here today enjoying a video. So for today's video, I thought I would actually approach this uh, through the lens of working a project. This here is a very basic, basic tube, um, but it's actually a wrist warmer, a very simple, two by two wrist warmer. I really love this project. I actually worked this when I was trying out nine inch circular. So again, if you've been following my channel, you knew this project well. Before we jump into all the tips or tricks, uh, just real quickly, how double pointed needles work. Generally, when you get a set of double pointed needles, they come in a pack of four or five needles. Uh, Nowadays, more often than not, they come in a pack of five, so you can do what's called a five needle setup. And that just means that you have four needles in a square like this, roundabout. Your stitches are evenly divided between those four needles and you use your fifth needle to knit around and you get to the end of the net one needle and you transition to the next needle and the needle that had stitches on it is now freed to be your working needle. So that's how double pointed needles work. Uh, sometimes you still come across needles that come in a pack of four, and that's because the OG way to work with double pointed needles was to divide your stitches evenly in a triangle amongst three needles and knit with your fourth needle. So anyway, but yeah, I generally like to make sure that I get packs with five needles because sometimes you want to use 
a five needle setup and that gives you that option. The first time I tried to cast on with DPNs, I tried to like cast on a quarter of my stitches and then pick up my second needle and cast on the next quarter of my stitches and so forth and so on. And let's just say that is not a good way of going about trying to cast on with DPNs. My tip for how to cast on with double pointed needles is actually to use as few of your double pointed needles as possible to get started. Literally two of them. Um, I actually did an entire video just about how to cast on with double pointed needles and I will link it down in the description box if you wanna go check that out later. But I will go ahead and cast on quickly with DPNs so you can get an idea of how I do this. All right, so first thing I'm doing is I'm gonna cast on all of my stitches onto one needle. Um, for this project, I'm doing a two by two rib. So uh, that's a four stitch repeat. So I need to cast on a number of stitches that are divisible by four. So I'm gonna cast on 48 stitches. And for this, I'm using the German twist cast on. I do have a video on how to do the German twist cast on, which I'll link down in the description box. Six, seven, 48. So 48 stitches all on one needle. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to evenly divide the stitches between two needles. So I'm gonna go ahead and just transfer half of the stitches off the needle I cast it onto, onto this second needle. Five, six, seven, eight. So now after my stitches evenly divide between needles, I just fold, this is needle one, this is needle two. I fold needle two over, so the two needles are parallel to one another. And now I'm all ready to join my work into the round and introduce needle number three, and I'm gonna knit basically a quarter of my stitches with needle number three. I'm doing a quarter, 48 is 12. Four, five, six, 12, whoops. Okay, so that's needle number three. I'm gonna now introduce my needle number four, and knit my next quarter stitches. So one, I have now freed up a needle. This was the needle number one. It's now my new working needle. And I'm going to knit my next third quarter stitches. 10, 11, 12, and now I'm bringing in my fifth needle. So now all of my stitches are actually evenly divided between all of my needles. And I just need to knit this last quarter of stitches. And I'm back at the beginning of my round. And now here I am. And with all my stitches evenly divided, everything stayed nice and stable. I was able to very easily avoid any twist because my stitches were never flopping all over the place. I learned this when I took a sock knitting class online with Lucy Neatby, and I've gotta say, this method has never failed me. Um, it's very common in this day and age for patterns that are specifically written to use DPNs to call for a five needle setup. However, a square isn't the most stable shape in the world. I've used a five needle setup, but consider if maybe your situation for your knitting would be better suited with a four needle setup, where your stitches are evenly divided between three stitches and you have a fourth working needle. If you're a They Might Be Giants fan, then you know that Triangle Man beats Particle Man.
particle man I think of as a substitute for a square. Um, triangles are very stable. The fewer needles that you are kind of working with sometimes, the fewer opportunities there are for the needles to be uh, poking you and everything is just a little bit more stable. Oftentimes with DPNs, you'll utilize them for shaping the crown of a hat. Because of the number of stitches involved, it makes sense to start off with the five needle setup. But once you get down to a certain number of stitches, it's not a bad idea to go ahead and reduce the number of DPNs in your setup and go down to a four needle setup so that you get that stability and you're not having to wrangle so many needles as you're working with fewer stitches. For this tip demonstration today, however, I'm gonna continue on working with the five needle setup. Now with four needles like this, as you work more rounds, things will get more stable and these won't be as floppy as they are right now. With DPNs, marking the end of your round can be kind of tricky because I can take a stitch marker like this and put it on my needle and start knitting and at first it's going to be fine. But once I'm done with this needle, it's just going to hang back here doing its thing and this stitch marker will most likely fall off. Another option to mark your round is to mark the first stitch of your round um, like this and that can be a very easy way to mark the beginning of your round and as every so often you just move your marker up or as a way to kind of keep track of how many rounds you've done, you can add a new stitch marker after so many rounds or after a repeat of the stitch pattern. And that way, not only are you marking the beginning of your round, you're keeping track of your rows. This is in the round knitting, Carrie. You're keeping track of rounds. But I find that sometimes these fall out or they're just in my way. My favorite way to mark the beginning of the round is with scrap yarn. Uh, ideally, it's just a uh, cotton yarn or an acrylic yarn. This is acrylic. And what I do is I take the scrap yarn and I put it over the running thread like this. And what happens is as I knit my first round, that scrap yarn gets trapped in the fabric itself. All right, so here I am at the back of the beginning of my round and there is my scrap yarn marking it. And then all I do is I take the tail of the scrap yarn and I flip it towards the front of the work like this. And then I continue on to my next round. And what I'll do is every round, if I'm wanting to use this to also keep track of the number of rounds I've done, every round I will just flip this tail over the working, the running thread between the first and last stitch of my round. That way I just have my stitch marker there at the beginning of my round all the time. It's kind of worked into the fabric very easily. I never have to worry about it falling out. I never have to worry about falling off. It's not my way as I knit into the next stitch. Scrap yarn as a marker for the beginning of your round is fantastic. Not just when you're working with DPNs, but when you're working with magic loop, two circular needles, whatever. This is always a great way to keep track of the beginning of your round. So let's talk about one of the biggest fears when it comes to DPNs. There's nothing on the ends to stop your stitches from falling right off the needle. People, when they, a lot of, and I was the same way. When I first worked with TPNs, I'm like, but there's these needles in the back that are chilling like a villain waiting for you to come back to them to work those stitches. And aren't my stitches just going to fall out, like fall off the needle? And then what am I going to do? Well, You've seen me knit a couple of rounds now. Have you noticed the stitches budging at all? In fact, if I shake my needles, look how much I'm shaking my needles right now. Those stitches are not budging off of the needle. I'm sure if I did that a lot, maybe they would start falling off, but nope, everything is staying on the needle just fine. The truth is, in my experience while knitting, I've never had a needle just fall off. So I guess my first tip when it comes to having your stitches stay on your needles is relax. 
it's unlikely to happen while you're knitting. It's much more likely that your stitches come off the needle when you put your work down and you throw them in a project bag, in which case you're going to want some kind of DPN stitch holder. Now, there are DPN stitch holders that are sold on the market that you can buy, but honestly, honestly, when I store my needles, put them away for a while because I'm not gonna work on my project for a bit, I make sure that I keep my needles, I get my need stitches centered up on the DPNs that they're on. Oops, just get that. Make sure they're centered. You kind of flatten it out, right? Kind of even up the needles. So you just put a rubber band around each end of the DPN and that should secure everything just fine. If you're very insecure or you are finding that your needles are falling out while you're working with DPNs, kind of the top tip I can give you in that case is to look at the material of your needles. Metal needles are obviously more slippery than wood, bamboo, or a plastic needle. So sometimes with DPNs, it is advantageous to use a knitting needle that's made of a grippier material so that your stitches will stay put. That being said, I often, often work with metal DPNs, but I don't work with round ones. I work with square DPNs. And I have found my personal experience that square DPNs, like the ones pictured here, these are my favorites, or these are some of my favorite needles, but I've found that working with square metal DPNs, that the square shape just kind of helps keep the stitches in place more easily. And again, I've just, I've never had that issue with my needles falling out. But if you are running into that, you definitely want to look at what kind of material or shape your DPNs are so that you're making sure that DPNs are helping you keep those stitches in place. One of the things about DPNs, and this is just true, is there's a lot going on with needles. <laughs> and sometimes, sometimes it can feel like you're working with a creature that was birthed between the odd mating of an octopus and a porcupine. <laughs> needles just are kind of flopping. Sometimes they start poking you and it can feel all very unwieldy. Frankly, you have to do some experimentation with how you knit to figure out how best to have the needles arranged while you're working so things stay stable and relatively out of your way. So the needle I'm always working with is the needle in my right hand and my needle in my left hand. The other three are non-working needles. A lot of times what people do when they knit with DPNs is they like to have the stitches on needles that they are not working with centered up. I personally am the opposite. I do something a little unorthodox. Once I'm done working with a needle, I take the needle and I actually push it to my left and I have the stitches not right at the tip. I keep my stitches safely away from the tip, but I keep this needle here that's to my right that I'm not working with pretty far forward. I have just found because of the way that I knit with my pencil grip, it just more easily stays out of my right, out of my way when it's pushed farther forward like that. It also has the advantage of when I come back to this needle to work it again, it's already in position for me um, to start knitting almost seamlessly. And that's one of the things about DPNs is once you get the hang of them, when you transition from one needle to the next, it starts to become almost seamless. The other thing to think about is how you keep your needles kind of stacked on top of each other. I have two non-working needles here, one on my left, one on my right. I want to make sure that I keep this needle that I'm working off of on top of both of those needles. And I have found that doing that just really helps keep those needles out of my way and under control. So those are things that you kind of want to look at when you're figuring out how to keep your needles arranged in a way that's going to work best for you. Um, do you like to keep your stitches more centered on the non-working needles? Or does it work better if you keep that non-working needle pushed a little far forward or a little farther back? And do you want to keep the working needles that you're working on 
on top of the non-working needles, or does it work better for you to have those needles kind of underneath? That is one thing with knitting. This is a highly personal activity in many ways, and sometimes you gotta just experiment to see what works best for you. Next challenge with DPNs, letters. All right, so when you work with DPNs, one of the big challenges, you have these transition spots. Those are the spots where you transition from having finished working stitches off of one needle and now you're going to work off stitches off the next needle. These points can be an area of concern when it comes to tension. It's very easy and it's very common for this last stitch on a DPN to get loose and sloppy. If you have a series of stitches that are loose, all stacked up on top of one another, you get what we call a ladder, which is just, which is just a column of loose stitches. It's a very common way to avoid them is to do what's called transfer your stitches around. I'll show you what that looks like right now. I'm gonna just start my round like a wood. And I'm gonna get to the end of this DPN. Work my last stitch, but instead of immediately taking my new free needle and beginning work these stitches with this needle that's free, instead, go ahead and work a stitch or two like that, and then switch needles, okay? And you've now traveled those stitches around. And then when you get to the end of this needle, I do the same thing again, which I just work a couple of stitches off the next needle before I switch to my free needle. Now, I've been traveling my stitches around, kind of redistributing them, if you will, but I'm back at the beginning of my round. I don't, I wanna keep my stitches evenly distributed amongst all my needles. So even though this is the beginning of my round, and I'm gonna just flip my marker over, because I haven't done that in a couple rounds, I'm going to knit a couple more stitches onto needle number four, just to keep that consistent and all my stitches evenly divided. Oops, didn't actually finish that stitch, there we go. If you utilize this technique in order to avoid ladders, which it's a perfectly fine technique to use, that is something it's going to be even more important that you mark the beginning of your round because where it is on your needle setup is going to change. But again, scrap yarn makes a great, great stitch marker for the beginning of your round. Um, there's one thing else though about utilizing this technique to avoid a ladder, which is you're not necessarily avoiding loose stitches. You still might get stitches that are a little loose there at the transition point. What this is doing is disguising them. It's kind of hiding those loose stitches because one loose stitch in a round, you're, the eye's probably not gonna catch. It's when all of those loose stitches get stacked up in a column that it becomes obvious that there's a bit of a tension problem going on. But this technique can totally work for you. However, this is not how I avoid ladders. Um, the way that I work on avoiding ladders is to avoid the tension problem altogether, and it's a rather simple, straightforward way of doing it. <laughs> Once you get used to doing it, in fact, it's automatic in my opinion, but I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to knit my next round. All right, so here I am at the end, and I'm going to transition to my next needle. And when I do, I'm gonna knit this first stitch the way I normally would, that's fine. Now my next stitch, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my needle, I'm gonna put it in, but before I wrap my yarn, I'm going to give it an extra tug now. Then wrap my yarn and work that stitch. And what that does, I have found, is it tightens up both this first stitch on the needle and this last stitch on the previous needle without over tightening them. And it's a very simple way of avoiding ladders without having to redistribute your stitches and all of that. Um, again, I'll do it again. There's my last stitch, move to my next stitch, knit my next stitch the way I would, 
my insert my needle into the second stitch, then I yank a little harder to do as I wrap that stitch. This, by the way, was a technique that I learned when I was going through the level one master hand knitting class. <laughs> so this technique comes from a very good authority. I didn't finish the master hand level knitting class only because I, I got worn out and I didn't want to finish the writing. I did everything but the writing. But I learned a lot. I did learn a lot. I've done a few rounds in the year of knitting, and I don't think you would notice any tension issue here. It all looks pretty evenly tensioned. And I manage that just by pulling my yarn a little bit harder when I knit the second stitch on the DPN. I think I have a pretty good start on this newest iteration of a fingerless wrist warmer. And uh, yeah, I've got to say, I'm going to continue working on this wrist warmer utilizing my DPNs. Uh, I find this a really enjoyable way to knit. It is a efficient. I will say working with DPNs, it is very efficient. If you're someone with who has struggled with magic loop or two circular needles, you don't like all the pulling of needles and everything and you feel like it's really fussy, DPNs can be a really good way to go. For me personally, when I am most likely to use DPNs is with gloves and mittens. Um, the organization works well. It's really nice when you're working a gusset to utilize a four needle setup because you can have all of your gusset stitches on one of those needles and the body, the rest of the body of the glove can be distributed between three other needles and then your DPNs end up acting as a stitch marker for you while you're working that gusset. It is something I've done often that I really enjoy doing. Other times that I might choose to use a DPN is if I were knitting obviously the sleeve of a sweater and um, stuffed animals. They can be really great to use if you like to knit stuffed animals and those sorts of things. So yeah, I think DPNs, um, they're not for everybody. And if you don't enjoy them, that's totally understandable. There are challenges with them. Um, they take some getting used to. <laughs> they really do. There's a learning curve. I'm never going to pretend that DPNs like, oh, that's so easy. But I always believe that with patience and persistence, you can certainly master these if you want to. And I guess my question to you today is, do you want to master DPNs? Do you like working with DPNs? Have you tried them? Are you scared of them? Do you hate them? And of course, as always, what tips or tricks do you have with working with double pointed needles that maybe I didn't cover today? Because I'm always learning new things. I've learned so much from you guys. So I'd love to share that information with one another. That is it for me today. I hope that you enjoyed today's video and you got a lot of great useful information out of it. If so, please make sure to give it a thumbs up and share it with your other knitting friends. Liking videos, sharing videos, commenting on videos helps YouTube know that this is a space worth checking out and then the algorithm, the, the, the mystery algorithm, like shares me with other knitters and we can all help build this community together. If you have not already, please make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell. Subscribing and hitting the notification bell will make sure that you know whenever I upload a new video or start a live stream. Once again, down in the description box, you will find a list of materials that I utilized for today's video and some additional resources that can help you on your knitting journey. Some of these will have clearly marked affiliate links. And if you click on one of the links and go to a shopping website, make a purchase, that helps support my channel so I can buy materials for demonstration, for review, upgrade equipment, etc., etc. If you utilize one of my affiliate links, thank you so much. It's so appreciated. And if you don't, totally cool. I get it. Or if you're like Carrie, you don't need to purchase anything. You don't have to purchase anything, but if you'd like to leave me a tip, you can by either leaving me a super thanks or by buying me a coffee. My link to buy me a coffee is down in the description box as well. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope that you have a wonderful rest of your day, evening, weekend, weeknight, whenever you may be watching this. And as always, happy health and happy making. Bye.